Thank you so much for uh, coming back and, and joining us. And I have the pleasure of introducing um, our next speaker. Unfortunately, Marsha Firestone, who's the president of the Women Presidents Organization, is very ill and not able to join us. And she asked Susan Berry, who, uh, as you will hear, has uh, as much knowledge as Marsha. And they've been old friends and colleagues uh, for many years and starting uh, uh, really focusing on women-owned businesses. So I'd like to call Susan Berry to the podium. And Susan, thank you for joining us and for standing in on such short notice. Thank you. Appreciate Nancy. it. So I actually have two starts to my presentation, one that I had planned on and one that was inspired by the last panel. My aha moment was in 1986 when I was in Israel on a delegation from the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor looking at issues of women in work. And we were traveling around and one of the things we did was visit a number of the daycare centers and I learned that there was 100% government subsidized daycare in Israel and then it was up to the individual families as to which daycare they would send their children so they could do secular, religious, corporate, neighborhood, whatever worked for them. And I said to a gentleman that I was meeting with, why is it that Israel pays for 100% of corporate daycare? I mean, of family daycare, children for children. And he said, well, Israel is a very small co country and it is very important to us that we have the intellectual capacity of all of our citizens. And the light bulb went over my head that the problem in the US is that we don't value the contribution of half the population. Um, so a little bit of a downer on the issue was that their tax rate is 75%, so they can well afford in a far greater way than the US can to pay for that daycare. But one of the things we should be looking at is what percentage of the taxes we do pay should be going to things which help families. Because uh, it is not a women's issue. It is a family issue. It is a societal issue. Because somebody has to have children <laughs> or the society will not thrive. The other start I was going to give to this is, you know, one of the advantages of reaching a senior citizenship uh, level is that I know that while it may not be a women's revolution, it is a women's evolution. And I will assure you that we are making progress. When I graduated from college in 1967 and started looking for my first job, the want to add pages in the newspaper were positions for men and positions for women. So the world certainly has changed a little bit. I send regards from Marcia Firestone and uh, she's very sorry she couldn't make it today, but I'm delighted to be here with you and I'm here representing the Women Presidents Organization. I've been on the board of the organization from the very beginning. It's 17 years old. And Marsha and I go way back before that when we were both involved with an organization here, founded here in New York, called the American Women's Economic Development Corporation, which was founded by a woman named B. Fitzpatrick in the 1970s to help women be self-employed. She wasn't even really thinking of businesses and employing other people. She was just looking at low-income women having the opportunity to create a job rather than get a job so that they can more adequately deal with the pressures on them, many of them as single mothers or in low-income families. Marsha and I started there and we both left in 1995 to start other pursuits. Me to start the Women's Business Enterprise National Council and Marsha the Women Presidents Organization. Marsha also served as the executive director in 1997 and 1998 of the Women's Economic Summit, which was sponsored by the National Women's Business Council, which is a federal advisory board that gives advice to the president, the Congress, and the administrator of SBA on issues that deal with women entrepreneurs. And it was held at uh, University of Maryland. The ultimate conference was held at University of Maryland. But there were four major areas that the summit looked at with position papers and the collection of data. One was access to capital, both debt and equity. One was access to markets. I headed up that one which is one of the biggest problems for women-led businesses and women-owned businesses is they didn't then, and they still don't to a large degree, 
get to participate in you know, what is fondly called the Old Boys Network. Access to learning. Uh, back at that time, believe it or not, there were no degrees in entrepreneurship. And, and many colleges, or most colleges, did not even provide courses in entrepreneurship. When people graduated with those MBAs or undergraduate business degrees, the assumption was that they were going to go in ent entry level positions in corporate America. Entrepreneurship is a whole other track. And the other very, very important issue is access to advocacy, because we know that nothing gets done. The greasy, you know, the greasy wheel get uh, the greasy, how does it go? <laughs> the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So this resulted in a framework which has really been used for women all over the world. It's being used in other countries. Uh, it's being used by some trade associations and, and, and others. And the result of this was the, really the, the growth, the rapid growth of the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, which was my baby, which certifies women-owned businesses through our regional partners around the country as being 51% owned, managed, and controlled in order to be eligible to participate in corporate supplier diversity programs which work to increase the number of women and minorities in global supply chains. I think one of the interesting things based on some of the conversation earlier is that WeBank is not a women's organization, it's a corporate organization. And its membership is corporations. And there are many, many men on the board. We've had male um, board chairs, et cetera, because those corporations are the ones that have the money and the, the, money and the opportunity for the women. It is our regional partner organizations throughout the country which provide the certification and are the quote unquote women's organizations. The women do, however, it, the organization was structured so that corporations control two thirds of the board, women business owners, and the regional organizations control the other third of the board. The women presidents organization sprung out of this same era and the focus of the Women's President Organization is not startup or microenterprise, on which there was a lot of focus at the time, but rather on the gazelles, on the fast-growing businesses, on the larger women-owned companies that were providing greater job opportunities, greater economic success in their communities. We started with, uh, I think it was three or four chapters, one in New York, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Texas. And there are now 115 chapters on six continents. We have most of our chapters here in the US. We have about nine chapters in Canada. And we have uh, two in South Africa. We're opening a third there. We just opened in Turkey, New Zealand, Australia, and Mexico this year. We would love to open in Iceland. So I don't know what the state of entrepreneurship is in Iceland. I'd love to know. And if anybody is interested in finding out about opening up a women presidents organization chapter in Iceland, I'd be delighted to speak with you after our presentations. At the same time, as a result of this, another organization called Springboard came forward to help women-owned businesses get venture capital and angel investment. You know, Women-owned businesses even today get, I think, 6% of the venture capital. Um, it's, it's a really, really, again, an old boys network that it's very, very difficult. Springboard has been responsible for some companies that I'm sure many of you are aware of, like Constant Contact, which I use. I had, as I sat here, one of my newsletters was going out at 10 o'clock this morning on Constant Contact. That was started. Zipcar was started with Springboard. Um, that little robot, that vacuum cleaner, that was started with Springboard. Uh, another organization that didn't get funding, which presented, was Cruise.com. And the reason that it didn't get funded was the belief was that it could self-fund through its own cash flow, and that proved to be correct. So there have been a lot of very positive. And then the other issue is the advocacy piece. And the women impacting public policy also came out of this 1998 report on what are the things that are needed to grow businesses and to give women the opportunity to grow their companies. Um, we've had some impact, but not enough. We just last week released our list of the 50 fastest growing women-owned companies, and it was a, a global presentation this year for the first time, rather than just US and Canada. The number one company was um, 31 Gifts, 
which was started by a young mother on her dining room table and in the past four years has grown from $38 million to $780 million in revenue. And it's a wonderful model similar to Mary Kay and Avon. I, I told the owner at the award ceremony last week that in college I was a full of brush saleswoman. So yeah, it's a, it's a well-tested model that's low cost of entry. I actually bought the kit for my daughter-in-law to uh, become one of their what they call directors for I think it was $99. And you can get started in business. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, one of the interesting things about the 2014 list is how these companies were financed, and we call it the three Fs, friends, family, and your own funds. So 26% of the companies on the list were, got their startup money from friends and family, 58% with their own funds. Many of them mortgage their homes or get second mortgages, and we thank the husbands when they're there so that allows that to happen. And only 29% used venture capital, and 4% of that was with angel investment. So we have a ways to go. Um, every year, we ask our WPO members what the most important issues are. And this year, we call it our Labor Day report. And this year, they said that the economic conditions over the past several years are a definite threat to the bottom line. I think we can all agree on that, regardless of what we do for a living or where we live. A really, really key issue, and it's one that the WPO at the chapter level really focusing on, is finding, hiring, and retaining employees. Health insurance and competition. I was telling someone over breakfast, one of the women in my, I'm also a member of the WPO on the chapter level for the past two years. When I left nonprofit work, I became a real estate agent here in New York, and you have to reach a certain level of sales before they'll let you into a WPO chapter. Marsh is very tough. But I joined a chapter, I'm pleased to say, two years ago. And one of our chapter members had a biz, has a business that employs 79 people. And she had hoped next year to increase that by another six employees. Then along comes Obamacare. So her challenge is, and she's a very progressive employer, and. She provides health care for all of her employees after they've been with her for eight months. Well, the type of business that she's in, she has a lot of people that start and don't make it to eight months. So there's a huge cost of onboarding people onto, insur excuse me, onto insurance and other benefits and then taking them off. So they have to be there for eight months and look like they're staying. But with Obamacare, you, she's going to have to pay from day one. The prices have gone up because they have to get insurance even though most of her employees are men, they have to get in coverage that includes maternity care, et cetera. Another one of the issues. So her issue is, does she cut back her business and fire 29 people or 30 people so she'll be under the 50 employee level? Um, she doesn't really want to do that. Uh, does she stop providing health care and just provide the, and just pay the penalty, which is a lot lower than the cost of the health care itself. So it's a real issue. And around the table, we discuss issues like this. We discuss hiring issues. We discuss health care issues. Um, I'm getting the two-minute warning. So I'd <laughs> like to just sum up by saying, um, in the last 17 years, new businesses have increased by 68%. Our renewals in our organization have grown by 72%. We've, uh, our, our companies in general have added 11% more jobs. They've, they've started more than 1,200 new jobs in the past three years as a result of these women-owned businesses in our network. And we're second only to publicly traded companies in the US in terms of job creation. Women are choosing entrepreneurship as a great equalizer, but we still need help, we need support, and we need visibility. Thank you. Obviously, we heard about overall challenges um, for both Icelandic women and American women. Now we're going to get more into a discussion of 
What are the challenges for the individual business owners? Um, I think, you know, as the United States, listening to the fact that um, Iceland is able to have quotas, it's very difficult for us to do that here. Um, we are a very litigious society, and unfortunately, it would be probably we would be sued for reverse discrimination. So where these quota issues are very much a challenge for us. But I think on this panel, we want to really just try to get down to the nitty gritty and find out what you feel are the biggest challenges. Uh, Susan, you mentioned access to capital, um, all the different, um, uh, I think, three or four points that you made. Um, if you were to s just say, what is the one biggest challenge that you hear from your women business owners in the WPO? Well, I think access to capital is probably the largest, but it's a close second. A close second would be access to markets. You really, you know, we, you talk about glass ceilings in corporate America. In entrepreneurial America, we talk about that brick wall, you know, that you can get in to a certain degree. You might be able to make your pitch, but getting those large contracts from major markets, and we consider the major markets to be the Fortune 1000 and governments at the state, local, and federal levels. That's where the real opportunity for growth comes. I use my own experience that um, back in the 70s, I was the first woman independent manufacturer's rep in the textile industry, and I had a six-state territory. And I called on mom and pops and retail chains, but it was really the big box stores that provided me the opportunity to make a lot of money. And one company I marketed to for two years before I got my first order, but my commission was more money than I made the year before. So you can expand that out to all sorts of fields and industries that you really need to get those large corporate and government contracts to grow your business. Right, and I think also from the international standpoint, all of the different organizations, the International Women's Entrepreneurial Challenge, which we work with on a chamber level, uh, the WPO, all of these uh, organizations are now becoming more international. And that's also because that is to make the connections, to help right. with the best practices, but to start to make the connections for peer advisory, for new markets, and opening up new markets. So um, well, I can certainly appreciate that challenge. Mm -hmm. yes, and how, what do you think is your major challenge? Well, I think I'll start by telling you a short story about myself. I started servicing on boards in the year 2004. And after that time, I was elected by, uh, by investors that believed in diversity. Uh, in this year, I was the only female on board. There were no females there. I served on various boards from that time until it was until the year 2011 that I first was servicing on, on a board with another female. Mm. Seven years. So in terms of the quota questions, I think it is very, very important that we pushed it through with this system just to get the pace of change. Today, what I think is the most pressing thing is to get the same pace down to the top level, to the C-level executives. We are not seeing this change in Iceland, and there I would like to see this. And the reason is, of course, we are seeing researchers that are saying that the companies are performing much better, and as Jon mentioned earlier, we are losing on opportunities. We have actually people there, very well educated, and then we are not using all those skills and expertise. Mm -hmm. I think this is the most important in business. Yes, okay. <coughs> I, I totally agree, and I have to say also that I think what has to change, and is going to change, is that uh, the leaders of future are not going to be the same kind of leaders that we had last century and the centuries before. And um, like like Jon said, um, we look at it, and we are starting to do that, we look at it more as people instead of, of gender. And we're not there yet, but we have to we have to begin and the leaders of the future will be people that that are gender blind. And they they don't um, and they, they see diversity as a value asset for their, their companies. And I also think it has, has to do with, has to do with uh, the way we look at what is successful and, and that we measure success in different types of, of uh, uh, in different things, not just in uh, counting 
trophies and uh, counting money and counting how many people work for you and how many countries are you uh, expanding to, but uh, but also have um, have success means something else. We are, we're not all to be leaders. We're not all to be pioneers. We're, we we are different types, men and women, and we should just. We have to embrace that more, and we see that now in Iceland, that after the collapse of, of the economy, that uh, now people that, that talk in this kind of way are the people that are being most listened to, mm -hmm. and um, and they are the most respected, and people who, young leaders who, who try to, to be as the leaders were this last century, they're just failing. They're failing quickly, and it's uh, kind, of, kind of sad to see that. But, but um, uh, then, then what is also really necessary is, is that we have, to have, we have to have gender roles. We have to have people that, we have to see people that do different things and they, we have to hear them and see them. And, and it's not just um, like every, for every woman of my generation, we, it was really important we had a female president. And it was, it was saying to us, we can do everything. And, and we believe that, we still believe it. And even though we've had a male president for the last 12 or 14 years, uh, we still believe it. But it, it's not, uh, has nothing to do with that. But it was just a great inspiration. And uh, I was told a story before coming here uh, about uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the prime minister of Norway. She was, um, she was just in her kitchen, and the television was on, and her granddaughter was watching the news. And they were, um, they were announcing that Margaret Thatcher was stepping down and John Major was going to be the prime minister. And her grandkid came running into the kitchen and said, Grandma, can men be prime ministers? <laughs> <laughs> So we have to have gender roles, and, <clears throat> and both, and also for we lack it for for men. If we if we if we want to have companies and 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 families and work together, we we need to have gender roles for men to say it's okay. I take care of my family. It's not the same way my grandfather did. I take care of my family as being a caregiver, not just a breadwinner. So mm -hmm. we need to address this more, and on men's ground, not on the way the women did it. They're not going to copy their grandmothers right. or their right. mothers. They they have to be able to do it on their own terms, and and because now we, both women and men are bringing in the bread, and so and we want to do it. So I think we need to have more role models. Right, I, I agree. I think that's uh, very important. And as Greta had said earlier today, it's really about all human rights. It doesn't matter whether you're male, female, purple, black, LGBT. It's about all human rights and the mixing of the roles for the better society. The men taking care of the families, the women, just changing it all up so that everyone is concerned with the entire community. And, and I think one of the things you said is very striking in that the next generations, and I'm sure we can all see it, if you see young people today, they're like, what do you mean? Of course I can be an engineer. What do you mean? I, I just got my MBA. I can be a, you know, a, a professor in math. So I think we, we used to have the term breaking barriers. I think that was very big in the 90s. But it's very true for this new generation. They're like, what barriers? And so that's really going to help to propel the conversation and I think propel more of what we're hoping will develop as the human rights and the blend, blending of the genders and just all for, for humankind. I know that um, we're working with several women businesses from all over the world as a WPO and many of the different women's organizations and some of these women have been uh, breaking barriers in these emerging markets Nigeria, a woman who's the first female president of the Fishing Trawlers Association of Nigeria, a woman from Cape Town who was a very strong steel manufacturing company. So people are and women are breaking down these barriers. So there's no question 
in many of the industries now, are you a man or are you a woman? It doesn't make a difference. You're moving ahead, you're a smart business person, mm -hmm. and that's the way you, you get ahead. So I know we talked about also the, uh, the access and the challenges to, um, to capital. Do you have the same issues in Iceland that we have here that women are still have a challenge in terms of uh, getting fair and equal access to capital as men do? Startup companies have problems getting financed mm -hmm. everywhere. And uh, I can say when I started my company, I, I, used, I had to go to um, friends and family okay, and my own and, and uh, uh, yeah, use my apartment and, and you know, do, do all that. But it's changing more and, and we talk about it as a problem that, that, young, uh, that both women and men should get um, money. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, we're getting there and it's always the start. Maybe if I add to that, because actually in, in startup companies, as, as Gripik is saying, they are having a little bit of difficulties in getting money in Iceland, but that re applies to both men and female. Mm -hmm. But men are more in the startup companies than female, if you look at that. Mm -hmm. So I think actually uh, it's hard often to get a startup money in Iceland, but it, doesn't, it isn't gender related. Right, I would not say that. I, th I think it's all interrelated to broader issues because a lot of it has to do to where do you network and who are the people that you meet. So it, once again, I hate to say it, but the old boys network, if you belong to a golf club, if you belong to um, some sort of men's fraternity or society and those people go on to be venture capitalists, <coughs> people tend to support people like themselves. And we really just have to change the dialogue everywhere. It's not a... Uh, it's not a single track that needs to be altered. It's, and I liked the, the comment that Deb made earlier about changing the vocabulary and the language. You know, we really have an opportunity today with social media. It used to be that freedom of the press exists for those who own the press. Today we all own the press. You know, people get most of their information from the internet, and I think that it's incumbent on all of us to change the dialogue. Don't just post what restaurant you went to post a thought about supporting people in general. I've spent most of my life in the diversity world, so it's not just women. It's diverse populations, and those are different from country to country, what's considered diversity. Age is diversity. Um, you know, so there are a lot of issues, and I think it's incumbent on all of us to change the dialogue of what we post, what we tweet about, you know, the information that we share, because we really can make a huge change. Absolutely, and I, and I think, you know, to your point again, the younger generation, if you look at the traditional ways of just getting back to raising capital for a moment, other than the three Fs, is you know you would go to a bank. Well, because of all the regulations and loans and high interest, it's very difficult unless you've got all your ducks in a row and you want to basically put up your firstborn child as, a, as an asset. Um, but these young people are coming up with alternative ways. Um, we just posted a really terrific guide on uh, understanding what alternative resources are to funding. Look at the Kickstarters. Look at right. all these exciting ways. It doesn't matter whether you're yeah. a male or female. These generations are coming up with ways to support uh, entrepreneurs and startups, which we know today um, is a very big portion, especially here in New York in the United States. It's entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. More young people are coming out of school. The corporate uh, uh, jobs do not exist. The jobs in finance do not exist. They're starting their own businesses, and how do they do that? I mean, even our public library right down the street here at 34th and Madison, they have uh, umpty ump computers there. They have about 50 people running businesses out of the computers at the New York Public Library. I mean, so there's so many opportunities now, and especially for this new fundraising right. and uh, this cra uh, crowdfunding. Kickstarter, I guess yeah, crowdfunding. Kickstarter is amazing. Very exciting. You're right. So the, on so Brian the, Williams last night, they had a uh, talking about a woman-owned business that started her company with Kickstarter. Right. So, so do you have many angel investors and venture capitalists? In, in Iceland that help to support your businesses? Well, well, uh, well, we don't have many, no. Mm -hmm. It is in Iceland, actually, we, there is a gap there. We have, we have venture capitalists. They, they are actually, they are on the, the growth side, but it's often difficult when you have a start-up company mm -hmm. to get 
financed. That is probably the most difficult part. But when you get on the growth path and you are showing actual results, it's easier. It gets more, more and easier. But in terms of a, a startup company, it's, it's often very difficult. Right. I think uh, one of the things that maybe we might try to do is talk to Golden Seeds Angel uh, mm -hmm. funding about opening a chapter in Iceland. This is again, and this is my last comment, that we're going to open it up uh, for questions. But there's an organization here um, in, based in New York that started up maybe four or five years ago, Susan. It's called Golden Seeds. And it's an angel investing firm. And they started and they only invest in women-owned businesses. They are now the fourth largest angel investment company in the United States. So obviously there's a lot of interest there. They have a lot of people who, are, who want to become angel investors and support this type of entrepreneurs and startup and so forth. So I think we'll open up uh, for questions and see what all you might like to ask of our panelists. Yes, please. <laughs> I, I, I think we need them. We're with you. <laughs> yeah, because because uh, we, we, are, we all have a calling, and, and my, many of us don't listen to it because we have these boxes we're supposed to fit into, and uh, we start to run after somebody else's agenda and somebody else's measurement of what's, what's success, and, and instead of just calming down and thinking what's what's important for me, and, and then acting on that. Um, like, uh, for me, starting my company was uh, 12 years ago was, was a mixture of things. I had been, I was very ambitious. I had engineering degree in fisheries, and I was in an all-male environment, and it never affected me at all. I just, I had no problem working in that kind of environment. But, uh, being in, for working for different companies, I, also, I always found that the bosses weren't so good enough. Good. <laughs> I, I didn't want a bad boss to have my future, holding my future in his hand. So, so also having this really great idea, I, I thought I just went my own way. But it's, it has taken me like a decade to realize that maybe I'm, I'm also measuring the uh, success of my company in milestones that the society wants me to, to measure it. I mean, I'm, I'm providing 20 people with, with jobs. I want it to be a good place to work at. I want us to be loving what we're doing, being proud of what we're doing, and, and also challenging ourselves. So we don't have to just be bigger and stronger just because somebody else is saying, but when it's right, when it's the right time to do it, when it's a, and it's uh, in God's feet, if, if, if you may. Yes, sir. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to see. John Hoppe from, from Chicago. Um, micro lending is important in, in India and in some emerging markets. Is some variation of micro lending relevant um, in the United States? It, it has been. And government programs have had micro lending on the agenda for oh, 20 years or more. And generally, they are combined with an educational program so that the lending is made as part of a, um, you have to go through some classwork and you have to go through some, I won't say monitoring, but some assistance with, with helping your business to succeed as well as getting the micro funds. There are many of us that believe that there has been an overemphasis on those smaller companies as opposed to companies that have larger growth potential that could have a greater economic impact on society in general in terms of creating jobs and opportunities in communities. Like she said, she creates the opportunity for 20 people to support their families and their lives. It helps them, it helps the community. Microlending generally is for self-employment more than building a business. And I think that there's a difference. I think that we really have to differentiate between 
creating a job for an individual as opposed to being on welfare or going to work in a minimum wage job, and entrepreneurship, which is developing a business and creating an environment for growth. Yes, please. Um, Joan Kavanaugh, and I'm a woman-owned business here in Manhattan. But I know my first business in the 80s was sponsored by the SBA in our country, the Small Business Administration. And that was both with insurance and with a nice uh, loan of 42000 A guarantee, not a loan. A guarantee. Your loan was from a bank guaranteed by the SBA. No, mine was directly with because they don't at do that, that time, anymore. At, they don't do that anymore, but it was at that time. Does your company, does your country have something similar to that, where you can look to the government to get financing, and as, as she pointed out, to outlay it's with the insurance, but also with a whole staff of people that are called SCORE, people who are retired from businesses, and they give you your their help and their mentorship Well, I think one thing that's of interest is um, in 2004, Marsha and I participated on the US delegation to the OECD's uh, meeting on small and medium-sized enterprises that was held in Istanbul. And following the official meeting, we had a meeting of women's business organizations from around the world. And I think there were about 30 countries represented. And what we found at that time was that in terms of entrepreneurship, the US was 20 years ahead. You know, what other co countries were just starting to do in terms of educational programs, in terms of government guarantee programs, um, we had already passed through that and were looking to the next horizon. But we were happy to be able to provide that sort of pathway and our learnings of what we had gone through and, and, and the importance of advocacy. Yes, Beth. Beth Daisy again. Um, so maybe a little bit of a naysayer to open up the discussion about this issue of the, looking to the next generation with changing values that will open up the landscape. And the reason I say that is because we've now had really probably 40 to 50 years of women who have been educated, have gotten into the workforce, have gotten into various professions with the idea that certainly when I graduated from it was an equal marketplace and there were no issues. When I graduated from law school in 1984, 50% of my class were women. So going forward, most law schools have 50% or more of their classes women. But the number of partners, for example, in firms in the US covers it around, I think, 16%. It is not reflective of the general demographics. And so the question arises, what do we need to do to change what might be a really inherent mindset. Um, I, I just read about a study recently that was done with a, a group of college students or, or MBA students where they were given resumes of people to look at and act as though they were hiring. And when they looked at those resumes and didn't know the gender and didn't have any idea who those people were, their hiring decisions were different and when they knew the gender of the individuals, and to the better otherwise, it was in favor of men. Mm -hmm. So there's some really deeply ingrained patterns going on here. And so the question I think we have to address is how do we really change that? Yeah, yeah. We get women to write better resumes. No. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, if I may, there is an underlying culture. In the culture that we are always trying to change, consciously or unconsciously, Men are raised to take care of their family. And ladies are raised to be pretty nice and accomplish something. But often we are, if you look back, we are always behind the scene, working behind the scene, supporting. So what we actually have to do, we have to stand forward. We have to take challenges more. So it's a little bit about ourselves, females. And then we have to look at men, ask men that are willing to support this and see the benefit of having both genders working there. There is one. We have to work with each other. Men, the time to put, they promote each other. We have to promote each other also. These are one of the facts. We can use KPIs in terms of having uh, managers 
uh, they are measured of how they actually recruit balance in, in the top le level management. So these are a few, fact, few things that we actually can do to, to move and pace the change in terms of this. But I think it's both inside females. We need to work on our side. And, and then it's the outside uh, culture, if you may. And also, I, I just listened to this lady talking. She was actually from BBC. And she was actually saying that it was very difficult to get females in interviews. Very, very difficult. And that is part of this culture. We are used to be behind working. It's true. So we have to stand for it, take the challenge, talk, talk and commune about this. I think we will move a lot by doing that. But I, it's not a perfect world. And, and uh, I, I, prior to this, because I'm in my own private environment, where, so I, I talk to different types of women before coming here. And I specifically, I, I did it by talking to young, older, and then generationally. And, and uh, my sister, 10 years younger, highly ambitious, uh, has a lawyer degree. Uh, she said, uh, the problem is the generation, the problem she's facing is that, she said, uh, we have to have more armors in our arsenals. We, we women, we have to have more diplomas, we have to have more experience, we have to, before we're even considered. In Iceland, still today, it's enough for a, for a man of the same age to be, to get a job because he's, his, father's son, and that would never be enough for a woman. And, and also, one of the things he said is that um, uh, we, are still, we are still struggling with our father's generation. They, they talked about equality, they want it, but they just don't want to give up their job for it. And, and it's so true, because it's similar to saying I have nothing against gay as long as there's none in my family. You know, are you willing to, to give up your job for maybe a younger girl? What does it say about you as a man that you, you, your job has been now been solved by a young woman? So it's, we are still, it's, it's cultural. We, we, are, we are facing this and it's gonna take time. It's more than 40 years. I mean, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And, and we are talking about it, and we have social media, and we are pointing it out. And, and, but it takes courage for men at, in my father's generation, and also the generation after, to, to be able to say, I'm gonna hire in my position a female. It still takes guts. Um, I think to your point, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very apt that you say it's a marathon. And one of the things that marathon runners do is when they run, they set goals. Okay, my five mile, they look in their watch, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And if we look back over the last 40 years, goals have been set, some goals have been met. But I think moving forward, we need to develop a universal checklist we're all in agreement, right? Is there anyone here in, in that disagrees that we still have uh, equity issues? I don't think so. So we can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but we need to make a, it's like David Letterman's, the 10 tips, the top 10 tips. Yeah. We all should, like Susan said, use the social media, promote your friends, promote women that you know. And talk reward people that are doing a good job and making their good job visible. Correct, or taking mm -hmm. corporations that you know are really doing a great job, like Susan mentioned before, uh, a company that we won't mention because we don't want to point out any specific corporations, but they're doing a great job emphasizing those, praising them, and really starting to turn the tide that way. The advocacy piece is huge. It's huge. It's slower, um, and it takes a lot, a lot of effort. But I think there are smaller milestones that we can set in our marathon going forward for our next 26 miles from this day forward. Just think about your own milestones that you want to set that will help you engage and move this conversation and not just move the conversation, but move the needle. Mm -hmm. We want to move the needle. We want the statistics. We want to be able to say, we were here, now we're there. I mentioned to Susan before, if we look at this 
as if it were a business. If gender equity is a business, we need to measure. We need to start now and measure how far are we getting along and think of it as a business and set goals and get there. So that's my spiel. I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> I think we got the high sign. And uh, is there any last uh, words of wisdom? I would just like encourage to everyone to play, play a part. One of the things that came to my mind in, er, in the earlier panel is you know, women are the majority shareholders globally in corporations. So if, as a shareholder, a corporation doesn't have women on their board or doesn't have 40 or 50 percent women on their board, when you get that little thing in the mail asking you to vote, don't vote for a board that's all male. Express your shareholder point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think that if every woman did that, I mean, women between their own holdings, what they're going to inherit because we live longer. I mean, we inherit from our husbands. We inherit from our fathers. And we have increasingly our own investments. We could control corporate America if we made our voice heard. Mm -hmm. Well, my, I think my three words will be the, the company. Why are we actually doing this? Company perform better with diversity. Number two, we want equal opportunities for everyone. And in the end, I think the world will be a better place with balance in all, all aspects. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank our you. panelists. For Thank you, Nancy. Thank you.